manifested as God's heirs and function as his heirs on this earth when the kingdom gets itself established. We are God's heirs and in accordance with the mystery program in this dispensation of grace. The time's coming like John was pointing out last night as we went through the latter part of Romans chapter 8 there. When, when the rapture of the church takes place, we'll be manifested and put on display as the sons of God in the heavenly places, functioning in connection with our declared inheritance with Christ as joint heirs with Christ, with him as the head of all principality, power, might, and dominion in the heavenly places. We're the fullness of him that filleth all in all in those heavenly places, and God's going to utilize us, the members of the church, the body of Christ, to fill up and occupy the positions of governmental authority in the heavenly places. And that's when our adoption is, its, is at its fullness, so to speak. And we, we have the redemption of our bodies, and we're up there in manifested form on display as the sons of God. Right now, as John was pointing out last night, and rightly so, we have the spirit of adoption. And we have the privilege right now, though we're going, we're going, to, be, we're going to be displayed or manifested sons in the future at the rapture and from that point on in the heavenly places we have the spirit of sonship or the spirit of adoption right now and we have the privilege with the spirit of adoption right now and God dealing with us as sons right now to function in accordance with the liberty that we have and to function as sons to God's honor and glory right at this present time we don't have to await to function as sons to God's honor and glory. We don't have to wait until we're displayed as sons. We have the privilege of doing so right now. And God expects us as sons in this dispensation of grace to act like sons, live like sons. And throughout our epistles, Romans through Philemon, everything the Apostle Paul teaches us, every exhortation he gives us is all in accordance with being sons and walking as sons, living as sons. And all the things we've been focusing upon right now, and the things you learn about here in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, and the things that Paul has to go over with the Galatians in the Galatian epistle is the issue of don't live like children. Don't, ex don't expect God to treat you like he treated his heirs Israel in time past when he had him under that tutor and governor principle of the law there. Expect God to be dealing with you differently as the sons he's made you to be. He's given you the spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship. He's going to deal with you different than the system that was in effect back here. He doesn't want you to, be, to, to think of yourself as a child. He's not going to treat you as a child. He expects you to think of yourself as a son. He's going to treat you as a son. He wants you to live as a son. And that's what we wanted to go over very briefly in this last time that we have here, we want to talk about some of the things in connection with living as sons, and I want to talk especially about one of the most fantastic privileges you possess as a son that you're going to be utilizing to the nth degree, so to speak, out here in the future in the heavenly places when you're displayed as sons. I want you to, I had you to turn to Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 4 to get ourselves underway. I'm going to change my mind on that. Just Forget Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 4 for the present time. If you've got three hands, keep, keep two of them in there and use the other hand to come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, I, I make little notes on a piece of paper here to kind of keep me on track as to what I want to get accomplished here. And what I'm doing right now isn't on my notes. So I'm, I'm off track already. I'm, I'm mentally unbalanced, and I'm also off track, so you're, you're in trouble here this morning, folks. But anyway, I want to underscore the fact that you've got a privilege once again to utilize right now in this dispensation of grace, the privilege of your sonship status to utilize right now that, that God wants you to utilize right now, expects you to utilize right now, that you're going to be utilizing to the nth degree out there when you're displayed as sons in the heavenly places. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Notice something Paul says here to the Corinthians when he reproves them for an inconsistency in their conduct when it comes to a matter of judgment that's occurred between two brothers there in Corinth. Verse 1, he says, dare, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? 
Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now he goes on and continues on with this. All I'm after right now is the two expressions there in verse 2 and verse 3 when he talks about the saints judging the world and you're going to judge angels. Now that's not judge in the sense of, 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 of a condemning judgment type. That's a judge in the sense of a governing sense. Because of who we are as members of the church, the body of Christ in this dispensation of grace, because of who we are in God's plan and purpose as the fullness of him that filleth all in all in connection with his position as head of all principality, power, might, and dominion, we're going to be put in positions of governmental authority in the heavenly places. And that means you're going to have governmental administration committed to you to carry out. That involves government, government judging like Paul is talking about, making decisions as to God's will in certain matters and you as a member of the church of the body of Christ in a glorified immortal body displayed as God's son in the heavenly places are going to be giving information to the angelic beings in the heavenly places regarding God's will in matters of what needs to be done and things like they're going to be making decisions regarding God's will in the heaven and you're going to be doing that folks you're going to be doing that throughout eternity if you don't like that concept, that's tough because you're going to be doing it throughout eternity. But the issue is because that's what you're going to be doing with it throughout eternity and God's given you the spirit of sonship right now to function as sons, you get a privilege right now. And God expects you to utilize it, understand it, appreciate it, and function in accordance with it of making decisions on your own regarding the will of God that you've discerned from Bible doctrine resident within your soul and to be doing that right now in the details of your life and to be making governing decisions, so to speak, regarding what God's will is for me in this situation, that situation, so forth there. And you're going to be doing that out there in the heavenly places as the, as the displayed, manifest sons of God and relating that information to angels. And they'll be carrying out your orders. Oh, you love power, don't you? Man, I lie. That's going to happen. All right, but anyway. What, 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 what I'm saying to you is, Paul's coming along here. Think of that for a moment here in the context of 1 Corinthians 6. Paul says, if that's what you're going to be doing. If you as a saint are going to be governing the world and you're going to be governing angels, can't you discern amongst yourself the smallest matters? He's making an appeal for them here to act like sons. You've got a matter between the two of you. What are you going to do? You're going to go to the law courts? You're going to act as if you need a tutor and a governor? to tell you what to do? Aren't you sons? You're not acting like sons. You're not even thinking like sons. And the worst thing is those law courts are full of a bunch of unbelievers and you're going to let their standard of values evaluate you. Now there's a lot more than that to that to this, but all I'm after right now is Paul's making an appeal for them to act like sons right now because of what they're going to be doing when they're the manifest, displayed sons of God. Now that's the issue I want to emphasize most in the time we have here this morning. That's the aspect of your sonship walk that I bet you dollars to donuts. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression. Right? That's a New England expression. I bet you dollars to donuts that the majority of you don't appreciate. That's not, I'm not being critical of you. I'm just saying sonship is one of the most neglected doctrines of grace in existence today. And I'm talking about among people who rightly divide the word of truth and know, and know the dispensation of grace. And even when, folks, even when folks come along and they say, yeah, I'm a son and not a child, a lot of them haven't got a clue as to what it means to live like a son. And we're not going to get very far in this, folks, and all I'm really doing is alerting you to this and giving you something that hopefully you see you have a great need to study out on your own and learn a lot more about and be thrilled with the privileged possession that's yours as sons to make decisions on your own regarding the will of God. That's not, that, that's not taking God out of the picture, by the way. That's not coming along setting God aside and you acting independently. That's the issue of you acting as a son instead of God coming along and putting you in under a tutor and governor principle. And it's the spirit of adoption you got, and the Holy Spirit leads you. And, and God works within you both to will and to do of his good pleasure as a son. Well, 
Come back now, if you would, to Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 4. This is, this is what we're after here, folks, an appreciation for this principle, this privilege of sonship. And I, I, I need to start off by telling you, as I indicated to you last time, that there's, that there's, there's a lot of differences between the tutor and governor principle of the law and how a child, was, how God treated his heirs as children under that tutor and governor principle and how he's dealing with us today as sons with the spirit of sons. There are a lot of differences. And we could look at at least, probably at least 10 or 12 if we had the time here this morning, if all I was going to do was start listing them for you. But I'm going to look at three to try and give you a, a general appreciation for the difference between a tutor and governor principle childhood walk and lifestyle and a liberty sonship walk and lifestyle. I'm going to give you three, but I'm, not, I'm just going to more or less mention the first two to you, talk very briefly about them, and then focus upon this real critical privileged issue of discerning the will of God on your own in the details of your life and God wanting you to do that. Not only wanting you to do it, but expecting you to do it. Let me remind you one more time here by looking at Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 4 that the issue in sonship, in contrast to being treated as a child, is the issue of freedom or liberty from the restrictions, limitations, controls, and so forth under the tutor and governor principle. Romans chapter 8, let's get to the verses that began this whole study on sonship, down in verses 14 and 15 here of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, Paul says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Notice once again that the issue is, as a son, you don't have the spirit of bondage again. The spirit of bondage is the law system once again with its tutor and governor concept that God has been using in time past with his nation of Israel as his heirs. But the issue is that's bondage, folks. We think of the law and we talk about the law oftentimes as bondage. It's a yoke of bondage like Paul talks about in Galatians 5 and verse 1. You've seen it have, a, have bondage to it in Romans chapter 7. It binds you to sin's mastership. It binds you to only operate on the weakness of your flesh. It is a yoke of bondage, but it's got more bondage to it than just binding you to the mastership of sin and binding you to the fleshly efforts and, 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 the, and the impotency, really, of your flesh. It also has bondage to the issue of a tutor and governor system. It binds you to being dealt with as a child and to be subject to extreme discipline, strict discipline for failures and things along those lines. It binds you to a restricted relationship with God. It binds you to great limitations on what you can know, what you can learn. It binds you also to not be able to function on your own and as an adult. It has a great number of, of, of ways in which it's designed to bind you, and that's why it's called a spirit of bondage. It also binds you to the issue of fear as the reason for why you do things. Now, what I'm after, once again, is you appreciate the fact that what we're talking about in possessing the sonship status, our position as sons in this dispensation of grace, is that we've got, the, we've got great privilege, liberty from that system right there. Paul doesn't have to come along and give you a list of what comprises sonship. All he's got to come along and say is it's liberty from the tutor and governor principle. If you know what comprises tutor and governorship, you know what you are free from and what you don't operate on in the dispensation of grace. Now, we haven't really talked very much, or in as much detail as we certainly could have, about the tutor and governor principle. Rick was asking me yesterday, where do you, uh, where do you go to find a list, so to speak, of, of, of things that describe how it is under a tutor, and what it's like under a tutor, and what it is like under a governor and everything? There isn't any list of those things. What you'd have to do, and we did a little bit of it yesterday, you go back to that law contract, 
and you just start reading through that law contract and you'll start seeing things that function and that, and that, and that are part of the tutor system. And you'll start seeing things that function as part of the governor system. I pointed out to you yesterday, and we'll focus on this one most once again, that under the law system, when it came to an Israelite wanting to know what God's will was for him or her in a particular matter, there was a council of judges set up within the nation. It later on came to be called the Sanhedrin. It got a bunch, bunch of corruption and a bunch of perversion added to it, but originally was established back in Moses' day, and appropriately and rightly so. And that Sanhedrin, that council of elders, judges in Israel, they were set up and, they, and, and there was a tribal structure underneath them and there was even a, a, a lower subordinate structure underneath those judges and if a regular old Jew, for example, wanted to know what would be God's will in a particular matter of his life, he could go to the prince of his tribe and if the, prince, the prince of his tribe was his counselor and the prince of the tribe, if he, could, if he could discern God's will, and counsel him, give him the counsel that he needed. If he couldn't do it, then he could go up to that council of elders there. And if the elders couldn't discern the matter for him, he could go to the high priest. And the high priest had the breastplate with the Urim and Thummim in it, and he could cast the lots, and the whole disposing of thereof was of the Lord. And God's will would be determined that way. Moses talked about difficult matters being determined that way. But your average member of the nation Israel didn't have the liberty to come along and take God's word to them and try and figure out on his own what God's will was in the matter. He expected to operate on that principle of governorship. Now you can go through the book of the law and you can find tremendous examples of that governorship principle in operation. What Paul's done in Galatians chapter 4 when he talks about the tutors and governors, he's just looked back at that law contract and he says in connection with treating heirs as children, it had those two main stays to it. And that's what you need to do. And in fact, I'd encourage you to do that. Take the time on your own to go back and study out that law and learn about the various ways in which the, tutor, the, the tutelage worked and the various ways in which the governorship worked and everything. But the main thing, once again, right now, is that for us as sons, we have liberty of freedom from that system of operation. When it comes to learning what God wants us to learn, this dispensation of grace, he's not dealing with us on the basis of a tutor that's got a strap on his side there and a stick on the other side or a rod on the other side, and when you don't learn what you ought to learn, or don't conform to what you have learned, he comes along and chastens you and whacks you and disciplines you and all this kind of business. That's not how you deal with an adult. It's how you deal with a child. And God hasn't put a supervisor over us today that, that, that tells us what we ought to do as far as the will of God in these particular matters, where you ought to go if you want some entertainment, those, those type of things, how, how you ought to dress today and things like that, and, 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 and other matters as, as simple as that. Now those are even more complex. There's liberty from that whole system. You're not bound to that. You're not stuck in that childhood state. You got the liberty of adulthood. You know, think of it for a moment in, 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 in natural life. Children don't want to be children all their lives long. From the moment children can start thinking about things and appreciating the fact that there's growth and maturity and that adults get dealt with differently than they do, they start thinking, what do I want to be when I grow up? And they start thinking what they're going to do when they grow up. And the fact that, you ever hear kids come along and say, man, when, I'm, when I get out of this house, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do this, that, and everything. They're looking, they're looking forward to no longer being dealt with as children. That's a natural thing. And it's a natural thing in God's program. And the foolish thing for us as members of the church, the body of Christ, is not to cry out, Abba, Father, but to act as if that's what I want. Truth of the matter is, folks, you've got an enemy within your flesh, and it does want to go back to that because that system gives the flesh the strength to operate and makes it the dominant thing within you. But if you appreciate once again what God's done 
And that's the only thing that'll ever change your mind and make you cry out the Father. You've got to appreciate what God's done. And he's given you the spirit of sonship. And that's what you ought to do. You ought to cry out of, in appreciation for the liberty he's given you. And the joy ought to thrill your heart to function as sons to his honor and glory. Now, there's a real problem, though, in all this. And we, we, we've covered just about everything that could be covered in the time we've had. But I know if John had a lot more time, he'd cover a lot more issues in, 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 in connection with this. You know, we ought, like I said, we ought to cry out in joy and appreciation for the, for the liberty God's given us and for the greatness of action, functioning as sons. But the truth of the matter is, most of us don't realize how great it is to function as sons. Because what you all you've ever, ever done and what your flesh only thinks about is this system. You know, I've dealt with Christians who've, who've come along and told me that they think that the most wonderful, one of the most wonderful times in human history was when God came down on Mount Sinai there and gave that law contract. And I look at that individual, I mean, you don't understand that law. John made a reference at the first study to Hebrews chapter 12 and the record back there in Exodus chapter 19 and following. And when God offered Israel that law contract and they in the utter stupidity of their hearts said, all the Lord has said we will do. Man, they never should have said that, folks. From the time Israel came out of Egypt to the time they came to Mount Sinai, five times God tried to tell Israel don't let me deal with you on the basis of your works. Five, that's why you got the record of Exodus 15 through 19. That's why he brought them to the wills of sin. That's why he brought them to the waters of Meribah. That's why, that's why he brought them to all these places. That's why Amalek came out and hit, hit him in the back and everything. And five times God educated Israel on the fact that you can't afford to let me deal with you on the basis of your works. You ought to come along and say, Deal with me on the base of your Jehovahness and your grace. And so he brings it to Mount Sinai, and he says, you've seen what I've done? I brought you an eagle. I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. I picked you up, and I brought you an eagle wings, all by my power, my Jehovahness, and my grace. And I brought you here. Now, have you learned what I taught you? If you do that, which I tell you to do, then you'll be my peculiar people. If they learned what God told them, they, they would come along and said, forget it, Lord. We can't do what you want us to do to become your peculiar people. You're going to have to make us your peculiar people by, by your Jehovah's and your grace. But rather than that, they said, all the Lord has said, we will do. And on the basis of that, the very next time they saw the Lord, that mountain burned. And the smoke was there, and the lightnings and the thunder was there, and a trumpet started blasting that every time God spoke a word, it got louder and louder and louder, even to the point where, as John pointed out to us, when we read it in Exodus 19 there, the people all backed off of the mountain. But Hebrews 12 said, even Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. <laughs> Moses more or less came along and said, oh, what have they done? Folks, this thing is not designed to be wonderful. That's wonderful. Amen. The liberty of grace. And the most foolish thing any member of the body of Christ could ever do is to, in view of who God's made you to be in Christ, giving you the position in Christ he's given you, to go back and live like that. Now, I've really done it to myself here as far as getting to those three examples I wanted to give you, three aspects. 17? 17? Three aspects of, our, of living as sons. I'm going to give you the first two real quick now and then focus upon the issue of the privilege of discerning the will of God on your own. Uh, you had Galatians 4 in your hands there along with Romans chapter 8. The only thing I wanted you to underscore there in Galatians chapter 4 once again was the fact that the issue was liberty as sons in bondage to the elements of the world back here, he said, but liberty as sons. Christ, the fullest of time came, Christ was made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. I mean, if you redeem someone, what do you do? You purchase them out from a bondage predicament that they're in. That's what redemption is. Sometimes you hear the word described as to purchase out of the slave market. 
Wasn't slavery bondage? The redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ produced redemption from this bondage system that that tutor and governor, bondage to childhood treatment, bondage to childhood restrictions, bondage to childhood motivation, bondage to childhood limitations, bondage to a bunch of childhood, childish-like things. And we've been liberated from that and given liberty to enjoy. And that's the issue of crying, Abba, Father, once again. All right, come with me very quickly. Keep the, two, the, the passages open once again, Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 4, and we'll just, we'll just list these, number 1, number 2, and number 3. There's more than that, but we're just going to use these as our examples here this morning. And like I said, hopefully it encourages you to say, man, I want to learn more of this and just get into the Word and start learning more about it. Romans chapter 8, once again, verse 14 and 15. In these two major passages, Romans 8 and Galatians chapter 4, Paul deals, Paul makes an example in connection with sonship contrasted to childhood in, the, in, in, in two particular areas, and then throughout his epistles especially, he deals with a third one. All right? But here's the first one. We, all we got to do is mention this because John's adequately covered it in the things that he's gone over in the bulk of the uh, information here. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Under the tutor and governor principle of the law, God treating his heirs as children, fear, once again, was the motivating factor for getting things done. And like I said, we've gone back to the passages there in, in, in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers there and so forth and seen Moses tell Israel that certain things were taking place so the fear of God would be in their hearts. And not only that, but the very way in which that law contract stipulated things and set things down, fear was the motivation. Man, you step out of line and you get cursed. You step out of line, you get judged. You step out of line, you get chastened. In fact, Israel's national history in, in, as set forth as a nation as to how the contract would deal with them nationally in Leviticus 26 comes along and says, if you will not do all these things, then I'll punish you. And there's five courses of punishment or chastisement the nation would come under throughout its national duration. And he says, if you won't be reformed by me by these things, I'll chasten you seven times more for your sins. You go back to the law sometimes, folks, pick up a concordance and look at how many times the concept of punishment, chastisement, is utilized in the law contract. That's because the tutor's there with the strap and the rod. And you step out of line once. There's a verse over in Hebrews chapter 10 that says that those that sinned, transgressed, Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Man, the issue was he died, he died without mercy. There wasn't any appeal courts and all this business going up to the Supreme Court and all this kind of business and, and, and execution of a sentence delayed, 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 delayed. There's none of that business. The law came along, you're guilty, bang. You get judged. And that's all fear motivation, great fear motivation, individually and nationally. But that's not the motivating factor with sons. We're liberated from that. Then, once again, in the natural realm of things, you got your children as parents. Your children grow up. They become adults. You want them to live an honorable life, do good things. When they're 25, 30, 35 years old, you're 55, 60, everything, what do you do? You stand as a watchtower over your son and your daughter there, and when they don't do what you want them to do, do you come over and spank them? How many times, Bill, has your mom spanked you in the last 10 or 15 years? Oh, well, that's a bad question to ask. She's probably done a number of times. But anyway, <laughs> but the, the, the thing is, you don't expect that, do you? And she doesn't expect to have to spank you. She's tempted. She's tempted to, probably. <laughs> Yeah, but the issue is, you see, you're an adult, so you won't do it. Well, the first of the three, once again, here is the issue of fear and motivation. That, that's not the motivation that's operating in this dispensation of grace. God wants, in view of what God's given you by his grace in Christ Jesus, the motivation for you and I to live honorably, well-pleasing in God's sight is the issue of love 
gratitude, thanksgiving, and appreciation of what God's done for you by His grace. God doesn't want you to, do, to, to think that I need to live an honorable life in His sight because if I don't, He's going to discipline me. Come over, for example, to Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, we'll just point this out. And what have I got left, Bill? About four minutes? Five. Five? Okay. We're just going to have to point this out, folks. And then we're just going to point out the second one. And, well, we're not going to do much on the issue of discerning God's will. But anyway, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth us out. We'll back it up here a little further, if you wouldn't. I want you to notice that the context here is the issue of dealing with the members of the, uh, of the body of Christ in Crete that Titus is dealing with here and their conduct and their behavior as members of the church, the body of Christ. He, sa he says, sat up there in verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. <laughs> Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Notice, the, notice that, 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 that whole passage, so it's speaks, bracketed in by the issue of sound doctrine, the word of God. Speak thou the things become sound doctrine, that some effects take place in the believer's life. There's some sound doctrine, folks, that's designed to produce within you conduct and behavior that's honoring and pleasing to the Lord as a member of the church, the body of Christ. And that sound doctrine, folks, is works, it effectually works in members of the body of Christ who believe it to, to achieve those ends, whether you're an aged man, an aged woman, a young man, or a young woman. And when your conduct and behavior does not match up with that, the word of God is blasphemed. Now, I want you to understand what the Word of God Paul has in mind here. Does he have the Word of God of the tutoring governor principle of the law saying that if you don't comply, you'll be cursed, God won't bless you? Verse 11. Here it is. Well, take up the, take up the, uh, the servants there at the, in verse 9, not, pardon me, verse 10, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. The doctrine that's going to produce a lifestyle in you as a member of the church, the body of Christ, that honors and pleases the Lord is the doctrine of God your Savior and what he's done for you when he saved you and who he's made you to be in Christ. Look at it, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men, teaching us. Does it say the law teaches you anything? The grace of God teaches us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who did what? who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify into some peculiar people, zealous of good works. The issue is he sanctified you, he, he's, he's justified you, he's sanctified you, he's made you a son, he's made you a peculiar people. You ought to be zealous of good works for that reason. There's your motivation. He hasn't come along and threatened you with a strap in any manner or form. And if you think he has, you're dead wrong. If grace isn't motivating you, folks, God isn't motivating you. Amen to that. Amen. I got 30 seconds. <laughs> and that's about as far as we're going to get. Hey, about a minute and a half? Come over to Romans chapter 12. The other liberty you have is you have freedom from the rudiments of the world. We're not even going to talk about that, folks. You're going to have to look at that on your own. Galatians chapter 4 and everything. The rudiments of the world, once again, bondage to the rudiments of the world, the elements of the world and everything is the issue. It involves a lot of things, but it especially involves the issue of being in bondage to a strictly regulated, quote-unquote, religious lifestyle in which you observe days, months, 
times and years, and you use ritual ceremonies like water baptism, physical circumcision, and things along those lines, eating not with things, certain meats, touch not, taste not, have not, you operate in ordinances, and things along those lines. Those are all the rudiments of the world. Those are all part of the tutor and governor system of the law. And you've been liberated from that. <laughs> that those are all childhood teaching aids that only have a shadow and no substance to them. God's treating you like an adult. He doesn't utilize those things with you today. You've got to examine all that, thing, that, that issue on your own. We have no time to deal with that. We've got no time to deal with this third one here. I'm just going to point it out to you. You've got the, you got the freedom from governorship and, 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 and limited decision-making. You go back and you study out the issue of the, 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 the opportunities an Israelite had under that tutor and governor system to, 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 to make a decision on his own. You go back and you, you read about that issue of, the, of, the, of the, the Sanhedrin concept, the judges concept, and everything along those lines. And you read about that high priest and his capacity to discern God's will and things like that. And you realize that the average Israelite didn't have, didn't, didn't have any liberty and privilege of operating independent of that system. That's part of the childhood treatment system and everything. Now you come over here to Romans chapter 12. You look at the first two verses here, and all we're going to do is introduce it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. There's your motivation once again. The mercies of God. And by the way, folks, love beseeches. The law comes along and demands and threatens. <coughs> love beseeches you to do something. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your boys a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. There's the whole issue of living a Christian life that honors and pleases the Lord, but it's on the basis of responding to the mercies of God. It's on the basis of knowing God's made you a living sacrifice. How could you be a living sacrifice? He had to kill you first, and he did that in Christ, and he raised you from the dead in Christ. You're a living sacrifice. That's your position in Christ. And Paul comes along now and says, I beseech you on the base of that, present your body that living sacrifice that's holy, acceptable unto God, which is reasonable. That's Romans 6, once again, verses 12 and 13. Yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And that's your reasonable service. Notice that's not your commanded service. That's not your demanded service. That's your reasonable. God's coming along saying, in view of what I've done for you by my grace, isn't it reasonable? That you live unto me. And be not conformed, verse 2, to this world. Here's the mechanics. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's the sonship practice. You got doctrine given to you now as sons to renew your mind with, but look at the privilege it gives you. That ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's your privilege as a son. It doesn't say, go to the pastor and ask him. It says that ye, as an individual member of the church of the body of Christ, might prove you're supposed to do that. The good, acceptable, and perfect will of God in the details of your life. Now what you got to renew your mind with, folks, is God's standard of values. What God values and esteems, that's what agape love is, by the way. You learn what God loves. You learn what God values and esteems. And you get in your conscience God's standard, his norms and standards. That's what an adult's supposed to have. When your kids grow up, they're to have your norms and standards in their head and operate upon. You taught them those things. And you expect them to live a lifestyle that honors you because they got your norms and standards in their head. That's what their mind's full of. And from chapter 12 here in Romans on, Paul begins to teach God's norms and standards to you. God's agape love. So you can prove 
the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God in the details of your life. That's your privilege as a son. Folks, your position in Christ and your sonship status is not a license to sin. It's a license to serve God as an adult. That's what you got. Now I've screwed up Bill's timing and tapes and everything like that there. Sure, far, far beyond than, than necessary. Folks, all we've done here is introduce concepts. And I know there's going to be shortcomings in that. John knows himself that there's shortcomings in what we've done here. You understand that also. You came here understanding we're going to try and cover three chapters in about ten lessons. And I, 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 I personally apologize to you if there's something that you're not getting. But don't let that depress you, deject you, disappoint you. Take it up as a challenge. In fact, I'll, John would agree with me wholeheartedly. I know he would. You don't accept a single thing we say up here unless you see it on the page of God's Word. And Norm, if you don't agree with me, you stand where you are. Because when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you get an account of yourself. And you cannot say, I believe this because Keith Blades told me this. The Lord won't accept that. That's contrary to sonship. Let me give you one example of that. Romans chapter 14. The whole reason why Paul says what he says here in Romans 14 about the weaker brother situation and letting the weaker brother be fully persuaded in his own mind about certain things is because God's treating him as a son. He may not know everything you know. He may still have compunction about meats, drinks, certain days of the week. He still may have trouble with the rudiment concept. But God comes along and tells you here in Romans chapter 14, you as a strong one of faith, don't you dare come over that weaker brother and tell him he can't do that thing. Why? Because God's treating that weaker brother as a son just like you, and God expects him to make his decision based upon sound doctrine and soul to the will of God in his life. Right. Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not the doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak, Weak in doctrine, weak in the faith. Doesn't know, doesn't know as much doctrine about and for this dispensation of grace as you do. He, he, one believes he may eat all things, but he, another who is weak eateth herbs. Doesn't eat the meats and everything like that. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. You realize that because God's treating you as a son, he receives what you do as a son on the basis of a sonship principle, whether two years later you learn differently and don't do it. Isn't that how a father deals with an adult? Sure it is. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. The individual, folks, who is in charge of the edification process of the soul is God. We have some folks here that are part of our church up in Calgary. They know full well that I don't run the edification of their soul. And I don't achieve it for them. God does it. All I am is a messenger boy who better be faithful to the pattern God gave for getting that edification accomplished. But God's able to hold them up. I might look at something that they do and say, I don't see why you're doing that. You're a son, don't you see? There's no need for that. But even when they do it, God holds them up. Look at the very next verse. One, esteem, one man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. The one who esteemeth every day alike knows there's no rudiments of the world in this dispensation of grace. The guy who esteemeth one day above another is operating on those rudiments. From the tutoring governor principle of the law. He has not learned all those things yet. Let every man be what? Fully persuaded in his own mind. That's acknowledging sonship. That's God acknowledging sonship and telling you you better acknowledge it. God wants that weaker one in the faith to operate on the faith on the small amount of doctrine he's got, even though it's a small amount of doctrine. He wants him to operate upon it. You come along, when Paul warns about you as a strong one in the faith being a stumbling block to the one who's weak, you know what that stumbling block is? You don't let him act like a son. 
You come along and say, I'll tell you what to do. I'll show you what's right. And you're as tutor and as governor. Fini. We're done. And on a high note, or a loud note, whatever kind of note you want it. Folks, take up the challenge. I told you at the beginning, sonship is one of the most abused, misunderstood, ignorant doctrines in the dispensation of grace. And all I've done is alert you to that. You go through Paul's epistle, you look at how many times he says, I speak unto wise men, judge ye what I say. That's talking to a son. When Paul dealt with Philemon, he says, I could come along and enjoin you that which is convenient, but for love's sake, I'll beseech you. He says, I could come along and tell you what to do, Philemon, but I won't. I'm not your tutor. I'm not your governor. For love's sake, I'll beseech you, just like God's doing to us all as sons. Okay, close your Bible. <laughs>